me, uh, Dr. Nazim Kemal Ure, is from the two Asian Intelligence and Data Science and Light Research Center. And today he's going to give us a talk about reinforcement learning for uh, complex decision making problems. I'll leave the floor to him without further ado. Thanks, everyone. And uh, once again, thanks everyone uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm always very happy to be here. Um, and I don't think the last time uh, we did this was like uh, three years ago, if I remember correctly, right before the pandemic, right? Uh, apart from the Yes, yeah. So it's always good to be back, uh, always good to give face to face uh, talks again. Um, um, so, yeah, today we are going to talk about reinforcement learning, but <clears throat> uh, sorry. Before we start, uh, let me ask actually uh, to students uh, how many of you are familiar with reinforcement learning in general? Like, Everyone knows what it is. Okay, so that's a great number. I mean, we should write because I know Bert Bergam is also giving an uh, excellent reinforcement lecture. Uh, I know, uh, reinforcement learning class. Uh, okay, but Sam, let me ask how many of you actually have, you know, at least a little bit of hands on experience with uh, reinforcement learning? Uh, did they, did, so you tried running something, running something? Okay, good. So that's actually a great number too. And um, yeah, and if you are listening from Zoom, you can also raise your hand uh, if you want. And uh, okay, so final question before we start. Uh, how many people here are using reinforcement learning as like a main resource tool in their thesis? Like, do we have anyone? You? Great. And it's a couple of people. Okay, three, four people. Awesome. Uh, so hopefully what I'm going to tell today uh, is going to resonate with you. Uh, because I will be mostly talking about some fundamental challenges in reinforcement learning on applying this kind of uh, tools to complex problems. <clears throat> uh, by the way, how is my volume? Can everybody hear me right? Should I speak louder? Or... <clears throat> okay, sorry, I have been recently sick, so my uh, voice is a little bit recent, but I think it will manage. Um, uh, and I, then, then we will look at, you know, uh, some possible solutions to handle these complex uh, problems. And I will do that through um, uh, looking at some of the case studies uh, from uh, some of the recent works we did at our lab at ITU, and hopefully it will be also useful for you. Okay. Okay, so introduction. Uh, so it is good that everybody is very familiar with reinforcement learning, so I'm going to keep this thing very short. Um, but I mean, it's always good to you know review the fundamentals a little bit, like what we mean by reinforcement learning, or like what are some of the fundamental definitions of reinforcement learning. So there are many different ways to define it, but to me, uh, the best way to define reinforcement learning is looking at it as a fusion of uh, control or decision making with machine learning. So what is the control part? Well, control part comes from the fact that we are basically trying to control an agent in a dynamic environment so and uh, this agent can look at the world and sense some kind of observations and based on those observations it executes an action and whenever it executes an action it gets an immediate signal called usually called reward and what it wants to do is basically come up with kind of strategy so that it can change state of the world so that after let's say n steps or you know millions of steps if the total reward it acquires throughout its experience is maximum if you are familiar with optimal control, that's actually the definition of the optimal control problem. When it is continuous, usually we call it an optimal control problem. When things are discrete, we usually uh, tend to say it, uh, call it decision making or discrete optimization problem. But that's what it is. Okay, so where does machine learning set? Um, so the machine learning part comes from the fact that in most applications, we actually do not want the transition uh, model or the reward model at the so whenever I execute an action in the world, states are going to change, my observations are going to change, but I do not necessarily know what that distribution is going to look like. The same goes for reward. You usually do not know what kind of reward you are going to get before we execute an action. So machine learning part uh, comes in um, through basically predictive modeling. So if I uh, interact with the environment enough, if I collect enough data, then maybe I can use that data and use some kind of machine learning algorithms to build a model that tells me either how effective my current strategy is. By the way, I take strategy of the correct term would be policy, as uh, you know, most of you know. Uh, or I can also use that data to build a model of the environment. Uh, and that could also be useful for executing optimal control algorithms. So that is the main definition of reinforcement learning to me. And there are some recurring themes and challenges. And this is actually what I, why I asked if you were familiar, because I know that if you are um, 
even has a little bit of experience working with RL algorithms, you have definitely experienced this one way or another. Uh, the first challenge or recurring theme is this balance between long term returns versus short term rewards. So usually it is not very difficult to come up with algorithms which can act greedy with respect to you know uh, whatever you have experienced uh, in recent uh, recently. So you can actually try to make you can try to maximize the near uh, term, like the immediate reward, very efficiently. It almost becomes like a two or three step optimization problem. But that's actually not what we want. What we want is instead of maximizing the immediate reward, we want to actually transfer us. From one part of the state space to another, where actual high rewards are waiting for us. So it's kind of like navigating in a maze. Immediate returning left or right doesn't matter. What you want is exit. So we are looking for long term outcomes, not the short term rewards. Uh, the second recurring theme is need for exploration. Um, because you don't know anything about the world, basically, in the beginning, you need to take a lot of random actions to collect samples. And you need to do that in an intelligent manner because you are just randomly uh, just you know visiting the environment. You might waste a lot of samples and do not uh, get any meaningful uh, results from the environment. So you need to be very careful about how you explore the environment. And recurring theories of stochasticity. A lot of these environments uh, comes with um, not uh, deterministic transition or reward from this. A lot of the environments that we want to solve in real life are stochastic. So just visiting one step or one action one time usually do not give you enough data to understand what is going on uh, in that environment. So you need to uh, basically deal with the variance in the environment, visit uh, different states a lot of times to acquire useful information. And the final challenge, which we are not going to do uh, today, uh, uh, thankfully, is the non-stationarity. Even if you understand what's going on in the environment, the environment uh, might actually change. Is there a problem? We were asking to make this screen. Oh, could make oh. Is it not? Can you turn off the speaker tab? Uh, sorry, the uh, attendees tab. Okay. I, I was also not the screen. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not projecting it like that. You can minimize now. You can minimize now, John. If the mind is yeah. Oh, this is a little bit better. Okay. All right, so we know at least by just looking at this slide, this is an interesting problem, right? Regardless of if it is useful or not, looks like an interesting problem. So it is worthwhile. It seems like it is worthwhile to study it just for the sake of studying it. But uh, most of us are applied scientists, right? I mean, uh, we do not study things for the you know sake of studying it. That is usually reserved for mathematicians. So we always want to link it to some real world applications so that you know we can motivate ourselves further that if we you know spend enough time on this, something you know useful is going to happen. And this is actually good news. Um, so the general panel of problems uh, where reinforcement learning can be used as a tool is usually called um, decision making under uncertainty. And many, many real life problems ranging from autonomous systems, operations, research, medicine, finance, language, and vision, they can be formulated as decision making under uncertain problems. Uh, for example, one of the applications we are going to look at today, and I know at least some of you are interested in some sort of applications, is going to be autonomous driving. I mean, when we, when we think about autonomous driving, uh, for instance, um, our agent is the car, and state of the world is basically the observations we get from the traffic. Uh, state so like whether there are pedestrians or you know uh, cars uh, that are on the same lane or the next lane to us their speed position etc and our actions can be either lower actions such as steering the car uh, or you know how much throttle we are applying or it can be something more high level such as changing the lane or you know uh, making a u-turn with the car etc and the short-term rewards are usually, you know, uh, how much discomfort you are experiencing from the manual of the car whether you are crashing. To somebody, uh, and of course, the long term reward is you want to return this, you want to get the car from point A to point B, such that this total rewards are maximized. So, you can see that we can formulate this as a decision making under uncertainty problem. Yeah. And there are many, many different problems of this nature. And if you analyze this, you will see that there are some common threads, such as you know, decisions are in sequential nature, uh, like I uh, mentioned. So, we are not interested in making one decision. We want to come up with a policy. We want to come up with a closed loop strategy such that our long-term returns maximize. 
And there's a significant amount of uncertainty in the dynamics and score signals. Going back to the subprime car example, uh, for instance, you usually do not know what other cars are going to do. Right? I mean, uh, you have some idea, you might have some predictions, but there is usually an uncertainty associated with them. And even if everybody was uh, you know, behaving in a deterministic manner, your sensors, your perception is noise, right? Your vision system or you know, other sensors are never going to work 100% accuracy. So even if everybody's you know, uh, playing with the rules, there's going to be noise in your um, perception. And on top of that, we usually do not take the model of their mind as well. So we know that there's a probability distribution. We can model it like that, but we do not know what those probabilities are. I do not know with probability, I don't know, 35%, uh, the car uh, in front of me is going to stop or not. I do not know any of that in the beginning of the problem. Okay, good. So, so now we know that reinforcement learning is, looks interesting, it looks useful, but of course, the third question you need to ask whenever you want to enter a venture like this is, Okay, well, is it doable? Like, I mean, do we have proof that at least somebody attempted to do this and got something useful? And the answer was, if you asked me uh, 15 years ago, I would say, well, I don't know. But if you ask me now, the answer is uh, thankfully yes. So if you look at reinforcement learning, like, you know, uh, if you seem to look at uh, both uh, old and recent developments, um, so RL started to become somewhat mainstream in the 90s and 2000s. And it wasn't actually doing great in these times. Uh, I was one of the um, one of the few PhD students. I started uh, working on this, working on reinforcement learning as a part of my PhD thesis way back in 2010. So reinforcement learning was well known. People knew it existed. But for example, if you went to ICML with a reinforcement learning paper, that would be a single session. And there wouldn't be any parallel sessions or multiple sessions for reinforcement learning. Now, if you attend these major conferences, there are usually all dates research for reinforcement learning and applications. So in 90s and 2000s, uh, it was kind of a niche area. Uh, it existed, but not, not a lot of popularity. And uh, there are uh, optimal methods. Like if you give me a small scale problem, a discrete problem, there are well-known algorithms. I'm sure you know them, algorithms such as, for example, Q-learning or SARSA, that can uh, theoretically uh, give you the optimal solution. And if you increase the problem size a little bit, we had approximate methods, uh, but by approximation, you usually meant uh, linear representations of that type. So you can take your uh, volume function or the model of the environment approximated with linear features. And then you can even solve uh, model size problems. And that was what my PhD was about, basically. Uh, if somebody gives you, uh, you know, a reinforcement learning problem, how you can learn linear dynamics, how you can approximate model linearly, how do you automatically, uh, you know, get features from them and then, you know, solve it and apply it to uh, decision-making problems or unmanned area ways. My PhD was in aerodynamics and astronomy, so most of the time our uh, applications were driven by aviation uh, applications. Okay, so this was 90s and 2000s, but now we are in 2010s, but now we are 2020s, but the real uh, breakthrough happened in 2010s, and as everybody knows, uh, the breakthrough was deep learning. So deep learning completely changed how machine learning uh, research is conducted. And obviously, reinforcement learning also got a hold of that. And we had uh, you know, this whole new field called deep reinforcement learning, which is basically reinforcement learning where you are using the neural network as an approximation mechanism, either for your value function, your policy, or your model. Like uh, you can use it to represent any kind. Of and especially industrial research labs were in the um, forefront of this. Uh, you know, revolution. Uh, DeepMind, OpenAI, and a lot of other industrial labs, they, um, you know, spent considerable amount of money to develop uh, amazing demonstrations. It all first started with uh, playing Atari games. So this was back in, I believe, 2013, 2014 or so. Unfortunately, right at the end of my PhD. So you can understand it was very frustrating for me. So I spent like four years on linear models, and now I am about to graduate. Somebody tells me that, hey, there are these neural network methods. Which were not respected back then, uh, by the way. So in 2010, if I went to my advisor and said, "Hey, I'm going to do this with neural networks," he was say, "He will say no. He wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> Probably." <clears throat> So uh, anyway, so this happened. So in 2014, there was this uh, huge paradigm shift. Uh, first, for playing Atari games, so basically DeepMind uh, developed algorithms for using convolutional neural networks for uh, processing Atari images and turn it into actions uh, so that computers can learn how to play Atari games from scratch. 
And after they received uh, funding by Google, uh, they extended this to uh, play uh, very complex board games such as Go, and which, will, which was kind of like one of the holy grails of reinforcement learning at that time. Nobody would actually think that there will be a reinforcement learning algorithm that can beat the human champion at all. Because the complexity and depth of the game was beyond anything that uh, people were uh, studying at that time. And after that, also after these boards and games, it started to make it into the real world. So we got uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, autonomous vehicles driven by reinforcement learning algorithms, robotics, seeing a uh, huge, um, uh, also some huge changes in that part. A lot of, uh, for example, robotic tasks also started to uh, benefit from deep reinforcement learning. And I know that Bersha is also uh, conducting a lot of interesting research uh, on the subjects. And more recently, I mean, we started to see applications like, uh, you know, if you ask somebody like 10 years ago, in 10 years we are going to achieve this level of decision-making algorithms, people would freak out. Uh, for example, I was partially impressed by um, uh, meta AI uh, diplomacy uh, demonstration. So this is the game of diplomacy. Uh, you can see my point, right? You can see it in here, and it's a very complex strategy game uh, where you need to collaborate with other players to make different countries. So it's like a strategy military game, but your actions are not simple, you know, choose this or do that action. Your actions are in natural language. So you need to communicate with other people. It can be human beliefs. It's natural language to convince them to take your side. And after they take your side, you can either betray them or go with them. Uh, so it is to be super impressive that now they got reinforcement learning agents who can generate actions in uh, natural language, convince other people to cooperate or betray them. So to me, that is like mind blowing. Like when I was doing my PhD, if you told me that this is going to happen, I, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't pass it. And another recent, more popular example, everyone knows ChatGPT, right? So it turns out that even ChatGPT uh, uh, benefited from reinforcement learning. So there's this uh, offline reinforcement learning uh, approach called reinforcement learning with human effect. They use it to fine tune the algorithm to give it a better performance. So, so even you know a lot of uh, popular approaches that you see in uh, machine learning are benefiting from reinforcement learning. So that's great. Everything looks good so far. Okay, so if this is almost all. What is this talk is about? Because I told you that I am going to talk about challenges, but this, you know, uh, seems great so far. Okay, so this was the good news. What is the bad news? Well, the bad news starts when you stop looking at the press and you start saying that, hey, this looks good. So how can I apply this to my problem? Okay, so I'm a PhD student. Let's say I started my PhD thesis. I am solving some kind of decision making problem. How can I use all of this amazing technology in my thesis? So now let's actually stop a little bit and imagine that instead of doing things for reinforcement learning, assume that you are doing for some supervisor. So if you are trying to solve a supervisor learning problem, then we will be in a much better condition, right? I am sure everybody has tons of experience with uh, working with supervisor learning algorithms. Actually, supervised learning. Right now, I mean, got up to the point that you can almost, almost treat it as a plug and play kind of technology. So, plug and play means that, basically, what I, uh, for example, listed here, you simply pick an existing architecture. Uh, there are lots of popular architectures out there. For your problem, you collect some clean data. And if there isn't enough data, you can always do transfer running and fine tuning. You throw some compute at it, and maybe you want to get amazing results, but if you just follow this recipe, who are guaranteed to get reason. Okay. So this is almost like plug and play. You download something, import something in five lines of Python code. It is going to give you something this. Uh, for instance, this is uh, a non-reinforcement learning example from uh, another project we are working on in my lab. It's a European Union project, a Horizon project. There we are trying to apply machine learning, for example, uh, detecting uh, defects in manufacturing, manufacturing parts. So for example, the task here is an injection machine is produced in a part, we take a picture and we try to segment the fault part image. It is not a super easy task. It is not like you know, uh, telling the difference between cats and dogs. So it is not that simple. But if you give me enough clean data, like if you give me 10,000 label images, I can go and pick a very well-known uh, architecture such as efficient tests, et cetera. And I can, you know, even with the standards, you know, great in this settings. If I train it, I will get reasonable results. I maybe I won't get 99%, but I will get 95%, 94% at least. So this is good. 
So supervisor, I don't want to say it is all. Obviously, there are uh, many different problems that you can attack there, but at least as a plug and play tool, you can trust it up to some. Degree. And the same can be argued up to some degree with unsupervised learning as well. Of course, not every unsupervised learning problem uh, because it's a very big uh, family of problems. But for some specific problems, you can also argue that unsupervised learning is also at the same. What about reinforcement? So can I, uh, you know, treat reinforcement learning as a play and play technology? Like if I simply formulate my uh, problem as a Markov decision process, and I simply go and say, you know, import PPO from stable baselines, I press play, maybe not great is that, but am I even going to get reasonable? That's the question. And I see some people smiling, so they probably <laughs> go through this experience, right? Okay, so the answer is no. Well, yes, but very, very small. Bit, okay, so um, there are problems where you can actually um, treat reinforcement learning existing algorithms as plug and play approach. For example, what kind of problems? If your problem has very dense reward signals, as in whatever actually executes in the environment, it gives you a positive or negative reinforcement. If your environment is very episodic in nature, for example, every 50 or 100 steps, you reset the environment to its initial state. So that, you know, uh, at least after 50, 60 steps, you reset it and, you know, you go back to the beginning and you can, for example, assess the things that it so far. Your environment consists of small episodes. And if the noise in the environment is not that high, as in, for example, if I apply the same policy uh, with no exploration to the environment, and, uh, most of the time, am I going to get the same outcome? So the noise is not that big. If those three things are met, you can apply existing P uh, algorithms such as PPO, VPN. I'm sure most of you are also familiar with these names. And you can get reasonable performance. For instance, let's say that when you look at the problem on the upper uh, hand side, uh, let's look at a human-age robot, where uh, the actions in this case are uh, the Input that you apply to each joint. So they can be either electric signals or they can be force or torque, depending on how you form the problem. And let's say that our reward is how much uh, distance this robot uh, obtains after we apply the signals. Okay. So you can see that every time robot makes a uh, robot makes some distance in some direction, you are immediately going to get a reward. So this is a dense reward. It is episodic in nature, you can simply uh, you know, after 60 or 200 steps, you can simply say that this is the end of my episode, go back. So the, your trajectories will never diverge too much. And finally, uh, most mechanical systems we have, uh, it's, right now we have usually a very low noise models for that. If you don't believe that, you can look at, for example, uh, achievements of Boston Dynamics, right? I mean, they are doing amazing things with human in troubles. And you couldn't do that if you don't have, a, you know, uh, if you have noisy dynamics or noise observations, right? I mean, so. We got uh, so our mechanical systems are not operating with high noise. Okay, but the problem is if you leave this kind of uh, specific problems and if you look at more exciting real problems, that is where you start running into a wall. For instance, uh, on the lower end side, we got a similar problem. We also have humanoid robots, but now the objective is not simple walking. We want to play football with these robots. Now your actions are still the same. Uh, but now you also need to uh, take into account the position of the ball. You need to take into account uh, your team members, other teams, and your uh, rewards are not simply, uh, you know, walking. You're, you only get a reward if you score a goal. Think about that. Reward is zero or minus one. At all steps, you only get a positive reward if you score a goal. So you can see that in this kind of environment, we got very sparse delayed rewards. So in order to even get a positive reinforcement from the environment, you need to execute a lot of actions, one after another, to get some reasonable uh, signal from the environment. Can I ask a question? Sure. So to me, it seems like in, in these kinds of simulated worlds, you can always have a view from the agent's perspective, which is limited and not, it doesn't cover the state of the world, in which case the horizons are long, uh, things are, very noisy and the amount of information you gather is, is very low. Yes. But I would say if I'm an engineer, not a researcher who's trying to publish papers, but an engineer trying to yes. solve a problem, I have the entire field, the entire dynamics, the entire physics knowledge of how things work. So I could 
really program this to work better uh, by providing the agent a more global view and more strategic approach solving things and uh, uh, therefore uh, circumventing the agent getting stuck in useless expo exploration trials from very weak signals. So uh, but I, I guess that's my biggest uh, we are your thank right. you about the, this important learning thing, right? So awesome. I'm so wondering what you have to say about. Yeah. Thank you very much for this question. That actually uh, kind of summarized the point of my talk. Very briefly. So yes. So what we are going to advocate in future slices. Uh, if you want to please reinforce learning is a plug and play approach. You know, like forget everything about domain knowledge, physics, or everything. Just you know, feed it to an algorithm and try to get results. You can only solve this type of problems that you see on the upper right side. In order to solve complex problems, treating the problem as a black box, decision making problem, usually with superiors. So that is where you need to uh, use your engineer way, like you mentioned, and you need to actually bring in some domain knowledge from the environment. But then, how do you do that? that there are actually lots, lots of different ways to do that. So we are going to actually discuss that. And for these problems, we will see that bringing a little bit of domain knowledge. Uh, actually makes these problems much more uh, solvable. And we are going to discuss advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, but yes, your point is right. almost the same. For so again, let, let me reiterate specifically what bothers me. A lot of the reinforcement learning papers appear to uh, go for solving a problem, but let's not touch this tool or touch that tool and touch that. It's almost like we want to solve this problem, but, but without using uh, these additional things which we could have Put into you. So uh, I guess you're going to talk about this. Yes, yes, exactly. So in a second, I will say yes. There are two ways to do this. One is the way we just discussed. The other is the like the pure reinforcement learning. But yeah, exactly. I believe you will get most of the answers, right? Uh, you know, in, in a couple of seconds. Okay. So uh, going back to this example, rewards are very delayed, and you can see that episodes are even not well defined anymore because I mean you can. Define an episode as like you know 300 steps, but what if it is impossible to sort a goal in 300 steps? Like, and what's going there? Or you can make it very big, and again, it doesn't. Uh, then it is going, you are going to run into a lot of variance problems, back propagation problems, you know, all kinds of stuff. So you can see that this is not a simple task which you can repeat very frequently and you know learn something about. It. And finally, the noise in this type of problems is much higher. Not because of the mechanics of the robots, but because mechanics of the environment. Now you've got opponents, and you don't know what your opponents are going to do. So they can be aggressive players, they can be defensive players. So every time you play the game, you can get a different kind of um, uh, opponent. So that introduces a lot of noise to the system. So you have no guarantee that if you execute a policy, you are going to get the same kind of uh, observations every time you run the game, which, which uh, did not exist in the problem at all. Like, because this is a long noise environment, more or less. If you trust your policy, you are going to get the same outcome. Okay, so, so there is no actually well defined, uh, there is not a good definition of what is a high complexity decision making problem. This is what I came up with. Okay, so if an environment has got very sparse and delayed the reward signals, very uh, long and high variance episodes, and high noise due to uh, uh, existence of external agents, that is what I would classify as a high complexity decision making problem. And unfortunately, uh, solving these problems using a plug and play approach does not work at all. It fails easier. Like, I mean, if you don't believe it, this is actually uh, open source available from DeepMind. You can import this environment, throw it your, uh, you know, most beloved RL algorithm, give it, uh, you know, uh, one month on, you know, any number of GPUs you want, do hyperparameter optimization, everything. It's on that Okay, so what can we do? This is definitely a challenge. So I would say that there is two distinct approaches how we can, uh, you know, approach this problem. Approach number one, which I would say the purest approach or the pure error approach, we can blame the RL algorithms. We can say that PPO, deep crown, soft actor, critic, you know, whatever uh, you like, hey, these algorithms are not good enough. So we should focus on these algorithms and come up with better uh, update rules, I don't know, better estimators. So we should treat this as a pure machine learning problem and simply come up with better algorithms. So you can try to do that and basically come up with a better version of PPM and you can, which would give you better performance. So that would be like the pure academic pure RL. Or 
what we can do is what uh, Hojam suggested. We can, instead of looking at this as a pure reinforcement learning problem, we can develop frameworks where these core array algorithms are one component of the framework, and we can build additional algorithms that surround this core array algorithm, which provides us some external signals about how we can uh, turn this problem from infeasible to feasible. And there are many different ways to do that. Uh, we will discuss that in a second. And in this talk, uh, as I have spoken you know, uh, five seconds ago, we are going to be uh, looking at this second approach. Uh, and there is no well-defined way for this approach. If it were up to me, I would call it meta-reinforced learning, but unfortunately, that is reserved for something else. So I don't have copyright to that term. So you can call it like high-level reinforcement learning. So instead of, you know, try to develop low-level uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, treat that as a tool and see how you can use that tool for problems to space different uh, range of problems to solve that. Okay, so of course, this is not completely new. People have been you know, trying uh, different approaches to uh, you know, this kind of problems. For instance, one popular approach is to use imitation work. So uh, for instance, again, uh, like I mentioned, for a lot of these problems, we are not completely blind actually. Like, I mean, we have some idea about how to drive a car, how to uh, you know, uh, play football. So even if we don't have an expert, we can come up with a heuristic algorithm. Uh, or we can come up with an algorithm that is not data driven. You know, uh, for example, for a car, we can see the right of control, and we've got uh, all this great, uh, you know, uh, linear and nonlinear control theory from many, many years of history. We can use that. The same thing with other robotics laws as well. And we can basically bootstrap uh, imitation learning and use that to help our reinforcement learning algorithm get a better performance. So, this is one direction that we can go. Another direction we can go, and that is actually how uh, you get this kind of demonstration is, I mean, this is uh, actual results from DeepMind. Uh, and you can actually uh, find the paper uh, from here. It was published last year in Science Robotics. Instead of treating the problem as, you know, uh, like this one block uh, of uh, control uh, problem, we can actually divide it into subproblems. We can come up with some kind of skill decomposition for the problem, as in, Hey, if I need to control this first, I need to learn how to pass the ball to my teammate. And maybe I need to learn, for example, if I am right in front of the uh, you know, goal, uh, goal line, how do I score the goal? So we can actually, instead of trying to attack the problem directly, we can first formulate what kind of skills are required to solve uh, this problem, and then maybe combine the skills together to solve a bigger problem. And that's obviously, as humans, how they attack the problems, right? If somebody throws a complex problem, you do not immediately try to solve the big problem. You go divide on concur, right? Which is one of the uh, main cornerstones of all computer science, right? It is divide on concur. So that is usually termed as uh, skill decomposition or hierarchical reinforcement. So that is one way we can go. And finally, another way uh, we can uh, approach this kind of problems is another favorite of mine called Oracle learning. And this, again, should be very intuitive and familiar to most of you. For example, when you start school, you do not immediately start taking uh, classes from fourth year, right? Maybe some of you do, but most people do not. So first, you take the fundamental courses like I mean, mathematics, physics, and after you understand them, then you go to uh, you know, uh, second year classes, third year classes, etc. So nobody attacks the difficult problem first. I mean, why not apply the same thing here? For example, if I want to solve this football uh, game, why, do I, why should I start with like 11 players, uh, you know, uh, versus 11 players. I can start with a smaller problem. Now, maybe where there are no opponents, I am starting, uh, I am by myself, and I want to, you know, uh, score a goal from the middle to, uh, to the other side of the field. So that is kind of like the course you get on first year. And then in second year, you learn how to play it against one opponent. And in third year, we add, you know, we increase the complexity gradually. So basically, we develop a curriculum and find ways to transfer solutions of easy problems to difficult problems. So these are uh, the kind of uh, things that people have been uh, researching in the last years. And there have been some uh, interesting uh, approaches and interesting results. And in the rest of the talk, instead of going through, you know, here are some of the most popular, you know, imitation learning, hierarchical learning algorithms. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just directly convey my own experience uh, working on this methods with my students on two distinct uh, case studies. Okay. 
The first case study we are going to look at is going to be, uh, once again, uh, an autonomous driving scenario, where we are going to look at the famous Carla environment, actually the Carla challenge, maybe uh, some of you are uh, familiar with that, and ask how can I develop a basically an agent that can you know, navigate in this urban environment that obeys all the traffic rules, uh, you know, and has good performance such that you know, it doesn't take years to go from one part of the map to the another. So how do I do that? So we will see that uh, our approach to uh, you know, this problem was uh, coming up with a hybrid solution of using mutation learning and reinforcement learning together to fuse them in some kind of smart way so that we can leverage both of their uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages to get good performance. So that is the first uh, uh, point that I'm going to talk about. Oh my God, I'm very slow, so I look at it. Uh, and uh, the case two, we are going to look at something completely different. Uh, we are going to look at real-time strategy. Specifically, we are going to look at StarCraft 2. Hopefully, uh, you like this game or you have some experience from this game. If not, no problem. I will explain the game a little bit. And you'll see that uh, in this very complex game, you can apply hierarchy skill decomposition and a little bit of curriculum learning to actually play this game at a very reasonable level, at least at a, against uh, pre-programmed uh, AI, the bots uh, that are developed by this. So that is what we are going to do in this uh, second part. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first case study, urban autonomous driving. And this is uh, sponsored by Intron Technologies, uh, by the way. I've been very lucky to work with this company for a long time. So they supported all the autonomous driving or automotive research uh, we have been doing in the last five years. Okay. So uh, the problem that issue is, as you know, I know some people, uh, at least uh, I know that Fakumujan is working on uh, autonomous driving problems. So uh, when I say it's a challenging problem, uh, I'm, I'm working that she's going to take it. And okay, so do you guys agree with me this challenge here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. So yeah, it would have been embarrassing if you say that and we are all this. You agree with me, that's, that's something. Um, okay, so you want to solve a problem like this, First thing you can say, hey, fine, why do we work with RL or anything else? So I'm going to define a rule-based agent because we know how to drive a car, right? I can simply write some kind of something like a state automaton, like basically a lot of it as statements saying that if there's a car in front of me, if it is, you know, there's 10 meters between me and the car, I'm going to stop doing this do that. Maybe you can bang your head against the wall for you know six months and come up with some kind of heuristic of the pilot that you know, uh, uh, looks at the environment and comes up with decisions like that. Assuming that your uh, perception stack is kind of like working down, okay? So we are going to ignore most of the perception part. Well, not completely ignore that, but it will not be only So uh, what we will see that in a second that uh, if you come up with a rule-driven approach, it is not scalable, it is not generalizable, and it is very, very suboptimal. So you definitely need some data-driven approach there. Uh, and we will see that, especially for this challenge, uh, for this uh, environment, people have actually developed a lot of both intention learning and reinforcement learning different approaches, and they got their uh, advantages and disadvantages. So we uh, were actually very serious about joining this competition back in 2021, I believe. And so me and my students, we actually spent a lot of time studying this. Um, and this is, by the way, what the uh, teaser for the competition looks like. So the competition is just some feature agent. So there are different town configurations. And basically um, uh, in the challenge, I mean, it is basically spelled out uh, in, the, uh, in the video. There are different kinds of uh, challenges. For example, there are pedestrians, there are uh, cars through wireless rules. Uh, there are both lights uh, that look like, you know, the lights that you see in the United States, lights are actually very far away uh, from, or the lights like the enemy, uh, they are right near to you. So you've got this challenging world where not necessarily everybody's playing by the rules. Uh, so people around you are making traffic violations. So you need to keep the violation of rules on your part to minimum. And of course, get the part from root A to root B as quickly as possible. And, and on top of that, um, there were this kind of like mini challenges laid out in the environment. Uh, so this was from year 2021, then we were attempting to join uh, the competition. So you can see some of the things that can go wrong and by coming up with a rule-based or heuristic uh, agent is, would not be great actually. For example, like I said, there are cars who are just going to ignore you. 
uh, there are cows uh, who are going to make uh, a, a right turn or left turn without signaling you. There is going to be uh, hazards in the environment. For example, there can be slippery uh, roads. There can be cars who stopped in front of you. I mean, there are all kinds of different, uh, you know, um, dangers on the road. And it is usually very, very difficult to think about every possible edge case and program a heuristic agent for it. This is why rule-driven agents, uh, they never generalize. I and mean, you can find all the edge cases in your simulation, come up with the rule for all of them, but you will see that it is not going to generalize them, and certainly it is going to be very solid. Okay, so what have been people doing in the last three, four years, because this challenge has been running for a while, so I'm not going to go into detail of uh, what other people were doing, but uh, mainly uh, what they are doing is most of they are using actually imitation learning approaches. So again, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with imitation learning is basically you come up with a uh, rule-based algorithm. It can be actually ex uh, actual driving demonstrations, but let's say that you don't have access to excellent demonstrations, but there can be uh, some kind of controller yet program. And you can actually make a privileged agent in the sense that the agent might actually have some kind of backdoor in the simulation environment, so they ignore the perception uh, uh, problems completely. And for example, the expert agent that you design, it has clean access to everything on the map. And based on that, you can come up with some kind of like a control algorithm that can reasonably have a good, uh, you know, good policy on you know driving on the road. And then, of course, this is not super generalizable. You basically apply behavior recording or imitation learning. You collect a lot of data from this privileged expert, you treat this as a supervised learning problem, and then your neural copy of the uh, agent, it becomes a much more uh, generalized agent, and then you simply deploy that. And that approach kind of works well. Uh, in the previous years, that was kind of like the dominating approach. Uh, but of course, there are some problems with this approach. The first one is uh, this hard coded autopilots, which we are going to perform imitation learning on, are very sensitive. To the spray defined rules. Uh, like I said, I mean, you can try to define these rules, but there will be always exceptions where uh, it is going to get stuck. And the and actually, another problem is this uh, in the model that you learn by imitation learning, it can only be at most as good as that expert driver. It is never going to get better than the expert driver because it is not the goal of the imitation learning. The goal of imitation learning is just try to copy. The original source as much as good as possible. Okay, what if you want to optimize the performance? And that is the area of reinforcement learning, right? Because reinforcement learning signal is trying to get a better driving policy. But then, if we treat this as a reinforcement learning problem, if you uh, throw a plug and play RL algorithm to this, you will not get any good results at all. Okay, so what can we do? So, our approach uh, to this problem was basically try to. Uh, get the best of both worlds by uh, trying to leverage the strong parts of imitation learning with uh, reinforcement learning. So, I mean, our approach is divided into several phases and uh, my students really like, you know, drawing complicated figures, but I will uh, try to, you know, uh, uh, sim simply simplify it as uh, much as possible. So basically what we do is we take a rule-based policy, okay? And fortunately for us, Karma actually comes with a uh, predefined autopilot. You don't even need to design an autopilot for your stuff. Karma uh, has a uh, basically a rule based autopilot, and there's, I believe there's a KID controller in it. So basically, it gives you some reasonable uh, demonstrations for driving throughout this. So we simply take that and apply well known imitation learning algorithms to it, such as uh, data aggregation, data algorithm, and the variance of it. So if you do that, you will have an agent which actually performs uh, like, like average well, like uh, for the most tasks. But like I said, it is not going to work. So what we do then is that is where the magic happens, the stage two. We run this imitation learning agent and we continue to monitor its performance. Whenever it gets stuck or does something silly, which we can measure by looking at our rewards from the environment, we stop the agent. We say that, hey, this imitation learning agent is performing very badly there. And it is not because uh, we didn't get enough expert data. Even the expert, even the autopilot makes mistakes in that sense. And there, we basically stop and perform a little bit of surgery around that area. We take that part of the environment, subtract it from the whole uh, mission, and basically define a mini reinforcement learning game where the focus is just letting an RL algorithm control 
the mutation learning agent for that small part of the world where the mutation learning takes. So this is okay for reinforcement learning because you are not trying to solve the whole problem. Instead, what we're trying to do is we extract like a 10 second uh, mini scenario from the environment. And then we try to apply reinforcement learning agent to fix that mistakes of the imitation range. And after we are happy with the performance, what we do is we continue running the imitation learning agent again. If there's a problem again, we run another error post. So we end up learning this mini area agents for the parts of the problem where the imitation learning uh, are failing. We also uh, train a pet uh, which can predict us. Hey, imitation learning is probably going to fail. I mean, this, uh, this uh, your baseline policy is not going to be good to And then we predict which RL agent I have seen in the past is going to be useful for this task. So we uh, let the RL agent solve this mini problem. After the problem is solved, we go back to the imitation learning also. Um, there's yes. a, there's an approach which does something. So this is kind of a critical scenario something, right? There are some scenarios to hold to. Process or to find the yes. I think they are doing that with dagger, like they're improving dagger. Um, by the I mean, uh, they are kind of starting these critical scenarios and showing the model mutation only, not another parallel agent. Yeah, so yes, so there is a true Yes, what would be the advantage of training an RL agent to handle critical scenarios over? Integrating critical scenarios via modified dagger, they call it R So, uh, because the first learning agent is getting performance signals, reward signals for how to fix uh, the problem. So, let me make sure. What you is expert labels done? What's the difference? Let the expert, expert it's absolutely failing in that scenario. So, let me actually show you an example in here. For example, the car autopilot that you can actually see that this is a problem in car lab. You run autopilot and uh, this is a bit expert. This is not even the imitation uh, policy. This is the car autopilot. If there's a car stopped in front of the car autopilot, it gets stuck for it. Because in the car autopilot, there is no uh, case for it. If the car in front of you doesn't know, you know, make a left turn, right turn, there is no if else statement in the car autopilot. So even if we perfectly take the car autopilot, we are going to get stuck. And uh, so what happens is when this happens, our algorithm, after it accumulates a lot of negative signals, say that, hey, there's something wrong with your imitation learning agent, whether it is the expert or the end code. So it stops the imitation learning agent and takes the scenario maybe five seconds before the scenario and turns it into a Markov decision process, well, like an RL problem, and tells RL that, hey, give me some extra inputs here so that I can you know, get out of the situation. And you can see that our, uh, our algorithm in this case, our agent runs have to go around the car and then it uh, gives the hand, uh, control back to the imitation learning agent. And uh, yeah, basically, that's it. if your imitation learning agent is perfect or if it is uh, actually generalizable by every scenario, then you can simply do imitation learning. You don't need RL. This is for the cases we know that our expert uh, is also going to be not perfect. Or maybe there is no expert at all. So that is also a very common scenario. So the, I mean, in order to do that, I need to ask someone to label me those those states, right? Let's assume that there is no one uh, to ask for. So, and this is what the all uh, agent looks like after the training and everything. So if you, I mean, the time is short, so I will try to uh, make it quick. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So this is a good way of figuring out where your uh, expert driver fails yes why not use it as a sign for whoever engineered that expert driver to improve it to re-engineer it so yeah sure i mean you can yes uh, so i mean what i believe uh, what we are trying to do here is we can also do that but very personally it's actually good for this type of problem so it is not trying to solve uh, the whole problem it's not like a five second ten second problem so RL is actually very good at fixing, you know, short-term problems by finding the big policy. So we kind of point that uh, that part. It's funny you say that it's good for solving short problems, whereas initially it was advertised for solving these long, long horizon, long-term oh, problems. Okay. Of course, <laughs> yes. so uh, so let me put it this way. Of course, these are relative. What is right. uh, what is uh, wrong? So what I mean by short and long here is so short would be one step, two step. So it is good for, let me put it this way, it is good for solving medium uh, size problems, uh, horizon uh, land problems. When it goes to very, very long problems, it starts to 
and from selected retail standards. And uh, this is, for example, uh, how does our imitation learning uh, works compared to the autopilot imitation? So this is no RL, this is like imitation learning performance. Uh, and there are three different scores. We can look at the color competition. We got the root competition, which is like how much of the groups from point A to point B uh, you are um, completing. IS infraction score is how much you obey the rules. Uh, like for example, if you pass on a red light, if you uh, you know uh, crash into another car or a pedestrian, and DS driving score is basically how fast you are driving the car, of course, under the uh, speed limit. So autopilot agent, for example, we see that uh, it gets, uh, for example, this scores 90, 82, 0.91 uh, in, for example, uh, this scenario, which is a complicated town. I mean, we can see the town here, I believe. This is what the town looks like. And we got a short route and a long route. And we can see that uh, our imitation learning performance, no uh, just imitation learning, for the route completion, it is very close. Uh, so we can see that we kind of imitate uh, how much route we are uh, completing, you know, reasonably well. But the other ones, driving score and infection score, we are worse. Just okay, because this autopilot agent is a privileged agent. It has complete access to every location of the car, state of the lights and everything. And on the other hand, our agent, it actually has a little bit of perception stack. It is actually doing a little bit of computer vision to understand where other cars are and where the lights are. So this kind of performance gap is visible. But if we actually look at, compare our exam, uh, uh, compare our algorithm, when we have reinforcement learning on top of it, compared to all the other uh, past winners of the competition, that is where we start to get more promising results. Uh, for example, in the short uh, scenario, uh, our algorithm, which is called DEFX, that is first limitation learning and X using reinforcement learning, in terms of both root completion and uh, driving score, it actually got the best uh, performance across all the different ages. And most of these are top, uh, were top agents in 2020 and 2019. So it gets better score for, uh, compared to almost all of them. And it also does better than our imitation learning agents. So for example, the root completion of pure imitation learning was 90%. But when we add reinforcement learning on top of it, we get to 96%. And similarly, uh, driving score also improved from 68 to 72 uh, percent. In the long scenario, unfortunately, we are we did not get the best um, driving. Uh, we, we did not get the best driving uh, score. That actually belonged to the winner of the 2020 competition, 92 competition needs algorithm. He got a slightly lower score, but at least in terms of group competition, we actually uh, again get the best score. So this actually shows that this method has some merits to it. In terms of uh, you know numerical scores compared to all the existing state of the art up to 2022, uh, so uh, in 2022 competition we joined but we did not use this algorithm. We actually uh, submitted a much poorer version of this algorithm, so we didn't get a good ranking. But this algorithm, uh, if we were able to submit it, would be in at this top three if we had the time to uh, submit it. But I believe. Uh, this year, there were even better scores, but this was after the publication of the paper. So right now we are working on a journal extension so that we can actually show the extended version of this algorithm uh, that can actually uh, dominate those other algorithms as well. And another uh, extension we are currently working on, this has just got published this. Again, a safety critical scenario sampling. Uh, but basically what we are trying to do is, uh, instead of using this method uh, for you know, experience an accident, then it happens. We try to look at all of our past experience and try to engage in scenarios where we would actually get stuck uh, based on the past experiences. So we are uh, using a combination of uh, Monte Carlo sampling algorithms and other stuff. And basically, engage in scenarios where our baseline is going to fail and go fix them before it happens. So we adaptively sample better scenarios and use reinforcement to improve that. So if you're interested, uh, there are two published papers in this topic. So this fixing uh, stuff that I just showed, it was published in ITSC in 2022 last year. And the sampling stuff, it just got accepted to it. Uh, and uh, I believe it's on archive as well. So if you want to find more about this, you, can, uh, you know, check those out. And right now what we are doing is we are working on a journal extension where we can uh, look at all different uh, maps with uh, different complexities and also consider a larger area of scenarios where we can show that uh, we are getting better performance compared to you know, all these state-of-the-art competitions. 
Okay, so quickly, I will go into second uh, case study. Okay, real time strategy games, completely different topic. So, real time strategy games are again very interesting problems for benchmarking reinforcement learning algorithms uh, because if you have some experience with StarCraft, Age of Empires, you know, stuff like that, you know that these are very complex games. You need to juggle a lot of different things at the same time. You need to set up a base, you need to produce workers, you need to explore the map, you need to attack the enemy, if the enemy is attacking you, you need to defend it. So it's a highly complicated uh, decision-making uh, environment, and the rewards are very, very direct, right? I mean, usually this game can take like half an hour, 40 minutes, and at the end of 40 minutes, you know whether you have longer game or not. Um, specifically, we are going to focus on the Starcraft environment. Why? Because uh, of the DeepMind Blizzard uh, collaboration, they have actually released an excellent package called PySC2, which gives you uh, API access to running uh, machine learning algorithms on uh, StarCraft engine. Okay, so this actually got very popular around 2016, 2017. So the first DeepMind actually released these mini games, mini scenarios such as you know collecting stuff, uh, building uh, marines, or you know solving simple navigation problems. And uh, so these are like actually problems for suitable to apply simple reinforcement learning algorithms. So you can throw the good can to this and you can get good results. And there's actually a benchmark you can, you know, sub, there's like a leaderboard you can submit to and see how your performance uh, compares. But like I said, these are simplified versions of the game, the actual full game, how do you attack that? So one way to do that is uh, basically you, people uh, use two main things. The one is the concept of mark reactions. So this is similar to the concept I have uh, defined before, instead of looking at raw actions, you basically package raw actions into mark reactions so that uh, the exploration problem becomes much more major. So instead of saying, uh, for example, uh, instead of defining the actions such as this unit should attack this unit, this unit should attack that unit, you can combine all of them into one action called attack. And if you execute that action, all of your units are going to attack everyone on the front. So this actually makes the problem much more solvable. So anybody who have attempted to solve the full problem, they usually use some combinations of uh, this problem. But how do you get good macro actions? Well, people mostly rely on uh, expert demonstrations for that. So that was kind of like state of art. But the real state of art, which I would call the nuclear approach, was the alpha style algorithm developed by DeepMind. So DeepMind basically, uh, if you go and look at this paper in nature, it's like a mind blowing paper. It is, uh, like uh, two of the person machine learning engineering right? They're basically combined every uh, possible uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning algorithm together. There is multi-agent learning, there's self-play, imitation learning, reinforcement learning, uh, expert demonstrations, mark engineering, and everything. Uh, I believe there was a lot of pressure on the team to uh, you know, uh, deliver. And they have actually delivered an algorithm called Alvastar, which was able to build the broad uh, champion in StarCraft. Okay, this looks great, this looks amazing, but there is one drawback, it is the cost. If you look at how much uh, GPU and manpower actually cost to generate or compute this algorithm, the unofficial budget is around 12 million US dollars. So that's like a mind blowing amount. This is like a, a startup series A in uh, you know, amount of uh, funding. So obviously, if as a university, we want to do something similar, I, mean, uh, I cannot go and ask to do that for 12 million dollars. Well, I can, but they will probably not uh, take me seriously. And let's say that I'm not interested in StarCraft. I cannot even you know, uh, use this architecture. I want to solve Age of Empires, for instance. I mean, how am I going to do that? This is very, very specific to StarCraft. So I need to, on top of $12 million required for training the program, I also maybe need to spend another $10 million for uh, funding the researchers and everything. So the research question here uh, we want to ask is, can we get a reasonable performance, maybe not the world-class performance, but at least can we beat the existing boards in StarCraft, which comes when you install the game? Can we at least beat them on the highest difficulty with a reasonable budget? Uh, I mean, I don't want to put a number there, but it, is, it needs to be much, much less than $12 million. Okay, so the first thing that when you are uh, trying to solve this problem, and by the way, I forgot to mention this is uh, sponsored by Assassin. We have been working together uh, on this problem for, I believe, more than three years now. Um, the first thing you can think is, hey, you know, this macro action concept is very cool because it is basically packing all these nice actions into one thing. So what if 
I simply define a lot of macros and then I execute them randomly because all of these macros, if I engineer them carefully, are going to lead to useful things. Well, it turns out that for small problems, that actually works. So, for example, in here, uh, you are looking at the uh, problem where we are controlling these guys on the left and they need to attack these guys on, on, on here. And if you are uh, doing that with raw actions, that is, if you are manually selecting who should attack uh, which, then the exploration becomes very difficult, right? I mean, uh, random action cannot achieve anything. But if we pack all these actions into one mega action, even if you run a random agent, it actually gets good performance. But unfortunately, this does not generalize into bigger games where you need to shuffle different stuff. So you cannot simply define a lot of macros, run them randomly, and expect good performance. You need some kind of orchestrated on top to uh, you know, uh, direct all of these random actions. So what we have done in this case, uh, what we have worked on this, come up with this uh, hierarchical uh, architecture where we are learning macro actions not from experts or not from, uh, uh, not from uh, coding them manually. Instead, we define mini games. Very similar to how, I, uh, how we did it in Defix, we simply uh, use our domain name to define mini games, which we know that if we can solve these problems and we can do them, they are simple problems. We can do them, we can solve them using uh, simple algorithms. Then I can combine these policies together and learn a high level policy, which would basically say that, hey, at this time you need to go and do this in that correction. At this time you need to do that and switch between them to get reasonable performance. And if the performance is not enough, then that is where we actually need a little bit human in the loop help. It is actually, you will see that very intuitive, very, really, very easy to look at the patient performance and see what is uh, lacking. Hey, I actually, if I define an additional mini game that covers this skill, then I can get good performance. So you might think that this is kind of like cheating. Hey, this is not automatic anymore. You have human in the loop. But I mean, let's be honest, all research has human in the loop, right? Even if you are solving a supervised learning problem, Let's say that you collected the data, you uh, run the algorithm, and let's say that you didn't get good performance. What are you going to do? You optimize all the hyperparameters. You uh, use the state of the art uh, network architecture, and it still doesn't work. What do you do? You look at data, right? As human in the loop, you collect more data and so that the algorithm performs better. So it is exactly what we are doing here. But instead of collecting more data, we add additional mini games, mini skills to the problem. Hoping that those media skills will uh, give us better performance. That is the main idea. So, here, for example, uh, we have an attack mini game where uh, our soldiers are basically looking at the enemy and try to uh, destroy them as soon as possible. We got a production mini game where uh, we are uh, collecting uh, you know, resources from the environment and basically producing units and getting rewards. And we have a defense mini game where if, one of, if some enemies are attacking our bases, how to defend them? So these are learned in isolation from each other. And since these are not very difficult games, they can be learned with you know, things such as EPO, A2C. We use A2C in this version. And once they are learned, this becomes our sub policies. And then we go into the main game. And in the main game, uh, we basically have an asynchronous uh, policy, which executes one of them. So that policy starts rolling. And we immediately look at, you know, should I take any more actions given that this production is going on? So we keep triggering the sub policies and orchestrate them to be the main game. That's the main idea. So for instance, we have only these three uh, skills and we go and try to solve not the main game, but a larger uh, mini game. For example, we immediately see that, uh, for instance, uh, if we have, uh, if we are trying to uh, attack the base in only one direction, we are not actually getting good performance. So our algorithm is not actually capable of uh, defending or attacking against uh, enemies, or if we are attacking, we can also be uh, Zergs in this game. Uh, it is actually not learning a very process. So what we do is, I mean, we, we, look at, we basically define, for, for instance, multiple enemies as an another skill. So if I'm not good with one versus one, I can also get a mini game where there are multiple enemies approaching from different sides and learn that as a mini game. I add it, I add it to my skill set and suddenly I got better performance. So we do this a couple of times and they end up with this portfolio, basically, of mini games. And then we can see that, for instance, uh, we can actually solve this main task very efficiently. For instance, in this case, uh, we can see that the performance is going to get better. We are able to uh, defend uh, against this group of agents much more efficiently. For instance, just for some numerical comparison, 
if we define these five macros and then execute them randomly, for example, for two different scenarios, we can get like 17 points or 17 points, where the maximum available score, uh, which is like a theoretical upper bound, but you can get from the same round is like 145 and 45. If you take these random macros and put something like uh, actual critic on top of them and you know, ignore everything else, you will get small improvements for the attack, but for the defense, you are not going to get any improvement. And in our case, uh, basically because uh, we are uh, solving these mini games and you know, uh, combining them in a efficient manner, we get almost maximum performance. So this actually shows that this has some merit, but this is still not the full game, okay? This is just like a medium level of the full game. What if we go to the full game? Okay? So this is like a professional uh, startup map. Uh, where the opponents start on the diagonal uh, opposites of the map, uh, and each player is given equal number of resources in the beginning, and the objective is to just destroy every building and unit the enemy has had. And there are also additional complexities. Um, for example, there are eleva different elevations in the environment. You can see the ramps, which allows you to change altitude. And for example, if your enemy is on the higher ground, and if you are on the lower ground, you cannot actually attack them, because you don't see them, but the enemy can attack them. So you need to also take elevation into account when you're attacking your enemy. You can also uh, deploy additional bases. You can see there are additional resources in here. Enemy knows your initial location, but they wouldn't know if you have other bases in other satellite locations. Uh, for example, if you, uh, there are 10 difficulties actually in this map, you can uh, open this start up and try to play this game by yourself. And I will say that if you are an amateur player, uh, difficult to one to three, it is doable. Difficult to four, five, six is difficult. Unless you have a good experience playing StarCraft, you will not be able to beat it. And after seven, eight, nine, actually the game starts to cheat. For example, it knows all the map, it can see in your, it can see your location, etc. So our goal in here was to beat level six, which is the highest difficulty where the computer is not cheating. And of course, it is not world-class level, like I said, but at least you need to have, I would say, hundreds of hours of uh, playing StarCraft experience in order to beat the game in level six on site. So my uh, students play StarCraft a lot for research purposes. So uh, that is what they told me. You know, that is the amount of stress. And of course, we want to do this cheap, okay? Uh, I don't want to solve this with $12 million in Alpha. I want to solve it and use it cheap methods. So what we did in this case is we took our previous portfolio and we expanded it with additional things. For example, uh, now we can also produce tanks, uh, which are actually very good for ground to ground and ground to air combat. And on top of that, we learn how to, for example, uh, produce airplanes. And these are not trivial problems because you have limited resources. At any given time, you need to decide whether producing planes or whether producing tanks is going to be good for you in the long term. And airplanes also has this amazing property. They can't turn invisible without this additional action. If they are invisible, an enemy cannot attack them. And for example, in the, in the beginning trainings of the uh, mini game, uh, the reinforcement navigation does not know how to actually use the invisibility correctly. So it doesn't use them and end up you know, uh, losing the game. But if you run enough actual crit on top of it, for example, it learns how to make it invisible in the beginning of the game. With some cost so that they can actually uh, destroy the forces very efficiently. For example, this kind of strategy is very, very difficult to learn if you are directly attacking the large game. Because in large game, you need to learn this on top of resource management and everything. But we learn this in isolation. Once the skill is set, we freeze it and we say that, hey, this is a skill we can use in the base. And then we run the full game and we check if we are getting reasonable uh, demonstrations. This is from the full game, this uh, animations that you are seeing. And for example, uh, the, the algorithm immediately learns how to use resources efficiently, how to produce different types of units. So it is not only producing tanks or uh, it's not only producing planes. It learns how to actually uh, deploy both of them at the same time. It learns how to do combat very efficiently. For instance, here, you see that our tanks are first attacking uh, and they do not go uh, actually uh, all the way to the ramp. They actually uh, trace back uh, they should trace back so that the enemies are on the lower ground where they can attack very efficiently. Again, this is learned from the mini game, okay? But it is executed in the main game. So uh, this is the main advantage of these methods. And you can see that uh, the pictures that you want to see on the right-hand side are the units that are being produced while attacks are going on. So this is why asynchronous algorithms are good. So it is not like we start producing something and we wait until that is complete. No, we give it a start. 
and the production continues. And while we do that, we switch our directions. So that actually makes it like a real-time strategy and not a turn-based game where you do one action and wait for it's going to happen. So you can see that production doesn't stop. And similarly, this is uh, a case, for example, aerial units, when their health is low, they learn how to turn invisible so that they don't get destroyed. Again, something you aren't finding in the game. Attacking the enemy base, we learn actually how to do that with different units. And this was not a minigame. We didn't have a minigame where the tanks and uh, soldiers were attacking at the same time. These are two different minigames where the hierarchical controller learned how to combine at the same time to get the mission done. Okay, so these were just pictures of what kind of win rates we get. So usually in each game, you play 20 games. And if you win at least 10 of these games, you are victorious. Well, for example, in level three, medium phase, like I said, if you even play StarCraft right now, there's a good chance that you might be able to beat uh, level three. If you give it to a random agent, it cannot mean anything <laughs> as expected. If we actually just give mini games and do not learn any coordination between mini games, just randomly select different mini games, actually, level three is so easy that you can win all the games just by ex randomly executing our mini game solutions. But as the level of difficulty increases, random hierarchy doesn't work. So level four, level five, level six, which was our very hard case, and usually you can beat this if you have 100 hours of uh, startup experience, then you got uh, the 13%. But our hierarchy, uh, the algorithm that we have developed, up to level five, it wins all 20 games. And uh, on average, in level six, we lose something like one game out of uh, 20 games. And okay, so this actually is very promising. Uh, but is it cheap? Well, it depends on the definition of cheap, but uh, we have got a small workstation with 4GX 2018s. It took us like one day to train all the mini games and the uh, mini games, uh, you know, uh, in the same moment. So, I mean, maybe if I did it on cloud, it would cost, I don't know, $200 at most, uh, I would say. Uh, so, this is much, much cheaper uh, compared to Alpha Star. And how does this compare with other uh, solutions that people have come up with? Uh, well, like I said, what other people does is they do not find mini games. Instead, they find macros. And to do that, they actually rely on expert demonstrations. We do not do that. Instead of relying on expert demonstrations, we give expert games. Basically, we use our domain expertise to find games where the RL agent itself figures out how to solve. So instead of finding expert demonstrations, giving games to solve, it's a much more scalable and easy approach. And on top of that, it's very intuitive. If you look at the game and try to come up with a, a, what kind of a demonstration I need, I need in order to improve this game, that's actually very difficult to do. But in our experience, coming up with this portfolio just only took a couple of steps. From five games, I believe we to 11 mini games in the end. And it was much more intuitive, much more easy. So instead of giving data, giving problems to the algorithm seems like a more scalable way. And if you want to uh, find more about this, this was uh, published last year in SciTech, and uh, but it doesn't have any results from the main game. So we have just wrapped up this, and a journal paper uh, is coming soon. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you're interested, I can uh, send you that one. Okay. Um, so okay, we are finally at the end. So a little bit of discussion is uh, I have tried my best to show that. Complex decision making problems cannot be directly attacked by all of those are algorithms. You need to use some kind of you know, this magic, IRC, Pelucum, uh, imitation, you know, whatever works in order to make it solvable. And my near term prediction, and uh, I mean, as machine learning researchers, we love predictions, right? And, and we are kind of like addicted to doing predictions. My near term prediction is we will see more applications of this nature. So, Pelucum's IRC, this is going to keep, uh, you are going to keep hearing about this a lot. And you will see a lot of different applications with that. That is my near term prediction. And my long term prediction is of course, as machine learning researchers, another thing we are obsessed about is being domain addressed, right? Because maybe one thing you didn't like in all these things that I showed you, these are, of course, specific to problems. Like you cannot take our defix algorithm and apply it into an online hero vehicle. You cannot take our StarCraft algorithm and apply it to an Age of Empires uh, problem. Right? And as machine learning researchers, we do not like that, right? We want to be domain agnostic, black box as much as possible. So my long-term prediction is eventually this will be automated as well. So we will have algorithms which can automatically discover the skills without any human intervention, automatically discover hierarchies, curriculums, and everything. 
but we are not there yet. I think this is going to take some time. And maybe after three years in my third world, maybe I will have a chance to you know, talk about the subjects. Okay, so I just want to wrap up uh, with uh, acknowledging thanking my fellow students at uh, I2AI. I have been very fortunate to work with really students at this world would uh, at that time. I'm very grateful to work with them. I would also uh, like to thank uh, other professors at I2AI, and I would also like to thank Chris uh, as well, not only for uh, inviting me, but uh, you know, we are a very, very small ecosystem. Right? I mean, I mean, IT and functioners, uh, I think one of the very few viewers who has dedicated resource centers to artificial intelligence. And uh, so I think we inspire uh, each other as much as possible for, you know, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think that's a great thing. And uh, I feel just uh, very lucky uh, to actually be part of this ecosystem. And of course, I want to thank industry partners uh, for supporting all of our work throughout the years. This went much longer than I anticipated. I am very sorry for uh, uh, taking this amount of time, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be able to answer. Thank you. I have one question. Sure. So, uh, what about transferring this uh, training policies into real world? So let's take uh, autonomous driving case as an example. Yeah. So these simulations cannot have the enough fidelity to match the real world, right? So these policies probably wouldn't work in the real car. That's uh, that's a great question. That's very important. Uh, that's definitely uh, very important. And I'm actually, uh, you are really lucky. I have a great answer to that question. Uh, when we were working with each one, that was one of the major problems that we had. Like, how do we do scene to real uh, transfer, right? I and mean, you train something in simulation, but how does it work in real life? Right? And uh, it was a lot of the spot for this presentation, so I didn't talk about it, but we spent uh, a lot of time working on that. And a new paper about this is going to come out uh, in a month or so. Uh, and the main idea behind the paper is you cannot just do that scene to real. You need to have a close to the system where right? you do scene to rule and real to scene. Okay, so what we do uh, in that work is, uh, and this has been verified on hundreds of hours of open driving in the roles of Turkey, Istanbul to Ankara, Ankara, Disney. What we did is, we started a simulator, run a reinforcement learning policy, we execute that in real life, and we collect data about how well this algorithm has performed. Then we look at the world model and go back and update our simulator. Uh, the dynamics of other cars, uh, like how well our car is for content, etc., so that we do transfer from real world to the simulator. So our simulator is a custom parametric simulator. So we make our simulator more like a real world. And then we run it again and we keep running this loop. Eventually, uh, we show in the paper that if you run this loop uh, several times, your per reinforcement learning performance in real world improves significantly. Uh, so yeah, I can uh, direct you to that paper once it comes up. This was our uh, way to handle it. Any other questions? I know you will have some time. I, I, I'm here in the afternoon, by the way, uh, so what should you kind of invite me to say? So we can also have you know, more in-depth discussions uh, in the afternoon.